morning, everyone. Good morning, everyone. There we go. Good. We're getting a little lax on the good morning, but it doesn't have to be. But uh, I greet you in Jesus' name this morning. As we were singing through that song about God's love, kind of forget the title of what it was. I was reveling in that a little bit again, thinking, why would God love me? Do I deserve God's love? Have I done well enough that he should love me? Why does my wife love me? I make enough mistakes that she should have cut, cut that off by now. That's what we think in our minds. But God's love is constant. And I get excited about that. This morning you can turn to start to 1 Corinthians 9. I say to start, these are introductory verses. Our text this morning will be Genesis 24. So we'll be turning to there after a bit. Title of the message is Striving for the Mastery. Striving for the Mastery. Right out of Scripture, really. We'll see that here in 1 Corinthians 9. 24 through 27. I want you to think this morning about runners. I want you to think about different kinds of runners. So you got the picture of someone who is out running. And that's not hard to do because you drive down the roads nowadays and you see people running. And when I see them running, one of the thoughts that goes through my mind is, why are they running? Why are they expending all of this energy? Do they know why? Is there a reason? So you have a runner that's going down the road and he comes to, this is antiquated, but a phone booth. Now there's some of you young ones might not even know what a phone booth is. If you don't know what a phone booth is, you can find it on the internet. <laughs> I was looking at pictures of them. A little place where, and he's thinking, you know what? I didn't call Bob. We need to talk about tomorrow's job. Now remember, he's supposed to be running. So he opens the door, and it's a folding type door, and he opens the door, he goes in there, and he runs in place while he's calling on the phone. You ever see somebody on a street corner who won't stop running until they can go across and they just keep on running? Is he still running? Is he as efficient in his running when he's in there? So he's not at his best. Okay, we'll stop that one. Another fellow is running along, or gal. They're running all out, and they're getting tired. This isn't worth it. They just stop. And then, of course, we've got the runner who will run and keep going. Okay, now let's look at this scripture, and if you didn't open to it yet, you probably know very closely what it'll say. Paul to the Corinthians, Know ye not that they which run in a race run all? Were all three runners running? We say yes in our little story. But one receiveth the prize, so run that ye may obtain. You are supposed to run as a Christian all out as if you are the one who is going to obtain. Now, how many can? It says in a real race only one can obtain. But the Christian is supposed to run because all will obtain. But still run as if you are the one. And every man, verse 25, that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. There we have it, striving for the mastery. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. I therefore so run, not as uncertainly so fight I, not as one that beateth the air. But I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. Now, literally, what he is saying is, I am running and I want to be diligent in my running so that 
I will end well. He says, I don't want to be one. I don't want to be one like somebody who's boxing the air is really what it says there when it says beateth the air. Now just stop and if you're like me and you like to get mental pictures and see somebody there boxing the air. Oh, here's some more air. You know. And you say, huh, totally ridiculous. In your mind you'd be saying, what's wrong with him or her? What's their problem? Uh, kind of like if you get the picture of somebody going into a spider web and off in the distance you see them in there and they're trying to beat this thing and get it off and you can't see what it is but they're going through a lot of motions. You know, what's the problem? The picture I got was this. You notice that in those stories of people running I didn't talk about the end, the goal. And I wondered how often I am running, just going through life, not really thinking about what it is I'm striving for. What is the end result that I desire? Do I have a goal? So I challenge you with the same thing. I've been challenged and I challenge you with the same thing. Or am I just a runner? And after a while, I quit. And anybody you see running on the road, you say, well, they're probably gonna end up at home or a gym or whatever, wherever they started from. But that's not the ultimate goal. Most of them are running to build strength, keep strength, and their goal ultimately is that they might do well at running and reach their destination. Proverbs, let me just share this one with you because I'm going to read it out of the New International Version. Proverbs 19, 20, and 21. Listen to advice and accept instruction, and in the end you will be wise. I would like to talk about goals this morning. And I could talk to you, and really that's just kind of a subheading, if you will, under striving for the mastery. There are other areas we could bring in, thinking about striving for the mastery. But we're going to think about goals. And I can stand up here this morning and I can say to you, anyone listening, anyone who will watch, and say, you need to have goals in life. Everybody sitting here this morning should have goals. If you want to call them New Year's resolutions, that's okay, but don't make them lately. I want to stress that in thinking about goals. To set something achievable. We'll stop there for now and talk about it later probably. Well, that's great, right? You need a goal. Reuben, do you have a goal? Joshua, do you have a goal in life? And, you know, I, I can come up to you and I can pick out and say, oh, Brother Dave, yeah, got some goals for next year? You know. What's well, good, the challenge is good, but how do we help each other reach this? Do it, actually do it. As we say, put it in uh, shoe leather. So this morning, out of Genesis chapter 24, and you say, Genesis 24 for goals? Really? Let's see if it helps us. Some interesting things go on here in Genesis 24. You know the story, Isaac is going to get a wife. So we'll read the first, I'm going to read the first 24, uh, first, read through to the 21st verse, and uh, we will be pulling some of the other ones out later in the chapter individually, bring out a few points. But Genesis chapter 24, starting at verse 1, And Abraham was old, and well stricken in age. Are there any old ones among us this morning? Oh boy, I'm looking around. I guess I'm the oldest one here probably. But is that old? Well, it says Abraham was old. So he was up in years. I should have looked up the years. I'm not sure. I know he was an old man because it says so for one thing. Well stricken in age. Doesn't say physically, but age. 
And the Lord had blessed Abraham in all things. Important thing that we're going to look at later there in verse 1. And Abraham said unto his eldest servant of his house that ruled over all that he had, Put, I pray thee, thy hand under my thigh, and I will make thee swear by the Lord, the God of heaven and the God of the earth, that thou shalt not take a wife unto my son of the daughters of the Canaanites among whom I dwell. But thou shalt go unto my country and to my kindred and take a wife unto my son Isaac. And the servant said unto him, Peradventure the woman will not be willing to follow me unto this land. Must I needs bring thy son again unto the land from whence thou camest? And Abraham said unto him, Beware that thou bring not my son thither again. The Lord God of heaven, which took me from my father's house and from the land of my kindred, and which spake unto me, and that swear unto me, saying, Unto thy seed will I give this land. He shall send his angel before thee, and thou shalt take a wife unto my son from thence. And if the woman will not be willing to follow thee, then thou shalt be clear from this my oath. Only bring not my son thither again. And the servant put his hand under the thigh of Abraham his master and swear to him concerning that matter. And the servant took ten camels of the camels of his master and departed. For all the goods of his master were in the land, in his hand. And he arose and went to Mesopotamia unto the city of Nahor. And he made his camels to kneel down without the city by a well of water at the time of the evening, even at the time that women go out to draw water. And he said, O Lord God of my master Abraham, I pray thee, send me good speed this day, and show kindness unto my master Abraham. Behold, I stand here by the well of water, and the daughters of the men of the city came, come out to draw water. And let it come to pass that the damsel to whom I shall say, Let down thy pitcher, I pray thee, that I may drink, and she shall say, Drink. And I will give thy camels drink also. Let the same be she that thou hast appointed for thy servant Isaac. And thereby shall I know that thou hast showed kindness unto my master. And it came to pass, before he had even done speaking, that behold, Rebekah came out, who was born to Bethuel, son of Milcah, the wife of Nahor, Abraham's brother, with her pitcher upon her shoulder. The damsel was very fair to look upon, a virgin. Neither had any man known her. And she went down to the well and filled her pitcher and came up. And the servant ran to meet her and said, Let me, I pray thee, drink a little water of thy pitcher. And she said, Drink, my lord. And she hasted and let down her pitcher upon her hand and gave him drink. And when she had done giving him drink, she said, I will draw water for thy camels also until they have done drinking. And she hasted and emptied her pitcher into the trough and ran again into the well to draw water and drew for all his camels. And the man wondering at her held his peace to wit whether the Lord had made his journey prosperous or not. Just a side note here about the water. For the man to take a drink of water, that wasn't that terrible much. But do you realize how much a camel can drink? And there were 10 of them. If each one drank 30 to 50 gallons of water, quite a task she took on. And that gave the servant time to observe. There are nine points that I'd like to share with you this morning, so obviously we can't spend a whole lot of time on each one of them as we go down through this scripture. Nine points to apply for achieving a goal. And the first one I'm going to share with you is look at your present situation. Look at your present situation. In other words, look at where you are right now. Abraham was old, well stricken in age. The Lord had blessed Abraham in all things. That was the present situation of Abraham. So where are you right now? 
where are you so that you can assess, if you will, determine what you should do different? Should there be a change in direction? Is there something I could be doing better? So determine your present situation and you're going to want to look at that from different angles. You might want to look at it from spiritual. You might want to look at it from physical, financial, relationships, emotional, whatever you want to put in there. Look at, look at everything. Is there anything I should change? Is there anything you should change? Something you should do different. Any changes at all that you desire? Do not procrastinate. For my own emphasis, and I pass it on to you, I have not here in all capital letters. Do not procrastinate. Why would I do that? Because I am good at procrastinating, especially things I don't like to do. And I'm probably all alone in that, right? No, anyway, got some of you saying no, no. I struggle with the same thing. I, the attitude is, why do today if I can put it off till tomorrow? That's procrastinating. You know what happens? Tomorrow doesn't tend to get here. So if God is leading you, then uh, time to move on. So Abraham, if you will, assessed and he took action toward the goal and I contemplated that for the first point. I sat back on it and I said, hey, the opportunity is mine. The opportunity is mine to have a look at where I'm at and where I can go on, as long as I have breath. I have that opportunity, I have that privilege. I can do that. Okay, so you have looked at your present situation. Secondly, determine the goal. You want to determine the goal. So what shall it be? Notice what he says in verse 3 there to his servant. I will make thee swear by the Lord, the God of heaven, the God of earth, that thou shalt not take a wife unto my son of the daughters of the Canaanites whom I dwell. You shall go into my country, to my kindred, in other words, to my relatives, and take a wife unto my son Isaac. So he says, here's part of the goal. Don't get a Canaanite woman for my son's wife we're not going to do that okay so for you and I you, we need to be specific I wonder if we realize and I try to sink this into my own brain that if I don't aim for anything I'll hit it every time if I aim for nothing I'll hit it every time nothing there's got to be something I'm aiming for. Are there times when you and I need to make course adjustments, direction? Yes, that comes along in life. Things happen. Does that mean my goal should stop? My vision should stop? Some questions to ask yourself, maybe. Why do I want to have this particular aim or goal in life? Why do I want to have it? And what do you want to be and do? What kind of person do you think God wants you to be? Does he want me to be exactly like preachers who have gone on before me, for example? Or does he want me to be me? He has a special purpose for me. He has a special purpose for each one of you. That's what you are to ask yourself. What is it? that God would want me to be and do. You see, the why is what motivates you. Why? And so we contemplate that and you say, why? Oh, this is why. I'm going to do it. I'm going to go for it. Why? And the how God will show. And God will help you work it out. God's going to help you solve the problems along the way because you and I know that any time we set goals, any time we want to get something done, we need some help. So determine the goal. Thirdly, you might look for a promise. 
And I'm jumping down to verse 7 for this. The Lord God of heaven, which took me from my father's house and from the land of my kindred, and which spake unto me, and that swear unto me, saying, Unto thy seed will I give this land, he shall send his angel before thee, and thou shalt take a wife unto my son from thence. Are you aware that the Bible has over 7,000 promises? That's a lot. So I don't recommend that you try to memorize them all you won't reach your goal. <laughs> but you do need to remember those promises. And you do need to find them and stand on them to help reach your goal. Eliezer, he, he starts to worry. Abraham says there from verse 7, he starts to worry. And I like what he said. The God which spoke to me, he says, it's, he said, unto thy seed will I give this land. Abraham's backing up. He's saying, God said, I shall get this land. My offspring shall get this land. So the same God is going to send his angel and he's going to help you on your mission. The mistake that we often make is too often we look at our limitations and we say we can't do it. Can't do it. And that's right. You can't do it. But with God's help you can. So you stand on the promise. Pick a promise to go with your goal your vision, your aim in life. And then hang on to that. Memorize it. Look for a promise. Fourth thing you might do is have a heart's desire for success from verse 12. A heart's desire for success. And he said, the servant said, O oh Lord God of my master Abraham, I pray thee, send me good speed this day and show kindness unto my master Abraham. Arthur and I were working in a situation where we had to dig quite deeply in a trench. And I don't like deep trenches, first of all. Secondly, I didn't have a good place to throw the fill dirt, so it's too close to the edge. It's too high, too steep. I don't like that. Stones get a start up there and go flying into the trench and so forth. So. I prayed to the God of heaven and I prayed, God, give us good speed today. No, we don't use that terminology. But I did pray that God would protect us and he did. Obviously, we're here and we're not hurt. He did do that for us. Well, that's, that's exactly what it says here in uh, the New Inter not the New International, but the King James. He says... Please give me success today and show unfailing love. Now, this is the part we need to get. To my master Abraham. Just rewording what it says there. And that's literally what he's saying. He says, please give me success today. In other words, the mission God is get a wife for his son. That, that's the mission. And I'd like to have success today, but I, I don't need this success to point at me and say, thou hast done well. You did good. Look, you brought a wife back. Wow, you're good. Now, no, he says, do it for Abraham. Can you pray that way? Do it for... I have. I've prayed that way. God... This would be great. Do it for that they might be blessed, that they might be encouraged, that they might be strengthened, whatever it is. Find your promise and pray for success with a proper motive. So pray about your goals, your dreams, your future. Is it okay? Now, when I'm talking about dreams, I'm not talking to what happens during the night. You have a dream, you wake up, and you say, wow, that was exciting, or wow, what was that all about? 
What I'm talking about is during the day you're saying, you know, it would really be nice if, and you fill that if in. Nothing wrong with that. Unless it's for fleshly, worldly pleasures. I think God wants us to have good things, but I don't think he's saying that should be your focus, but it's nothing wrong to have dreams. Now you take that dream, where you'd like to be, what you want to be, whatever, you take that to God and say, okay, God, what shall I do with this? God gave me a promise, and he's going to give help. A heart's desire for success. If I'm trying to determine how serious you are about this, I'll be a little mouse in your prayer chamber and listen, and when I hear your prayer and the level of sincerity, I'll be able to determine how serious you are about this. How serious are you about this in your life? We pray more when we depend on God. A heart's desire for success. Well, let's go on to five. What hinders me? That may be a good question to ask, so we'll just title this one. What hinders me? What is holding you back? One of the things that holds me back is I've tried before, what's the use? You know the feeling? What's the use? I've over tried to overcome this habit, I've tried to be more diligent in this or that, I, whatever, and it didn't happen. So what hinders me? Well, verse five, backing up now a little bit. The servant said unto him, peradventure, or we would say, what if this woman would not be willing to go along back with me. And I guess I paraphrase that a little bit. Yeah, follow me unto this land. Does that sound normal? What if this girl won't go along? What if, what if, what if, what if, what if? Too many times we're caught up in all of the what ifs that we might stick in. Scratch them. God will help you. Well, why haven't I reached my goal already? What's standing in my way? What, what's hindering me? Well, the what ifs will hinder us. Think a little bit about uh, Eliezer's barriers. I keep calling him the servant, Eliezer. How often had he visited this country? Now he had a goal, okay, we need to understand that. And it was to go to a country he'd never been to before. Headed to a different place. He's supposed to find a girl that he never met. He's going to Try to convince that girl that she needs to go with people she never met, with other servants, with ten camels. It just come along with us. We're going over to this strange land. So she's going to go to a country she's never seen or been to, possibly. And yeah, the reason that we want you to go with us is to marry a stranger. Oh, and uh, we're going to have to ask your parents if this is okay. No problem, right? <laughs> no big... Oh, yes, it is. You know as well as I do that we would stumble at some of that because we got too much human nature in us. Well, you look at this and you realize that from the beginning, Eliezer had these steps that he followed through. And he got to the well, and he says, let it be the woman, the girl, and he lays it out. 
is it okay for you and I to once in a while say, God, I would like this to be definite. So do thus and thus if you would. I think many times we're not as bold as we could be. And I'm going to let it at that. Now you've got good table conversation and discussion with each other. Is that okay? If I head down the road with no definite place to go, no definite direction, I just head down the road and I know some family, or at least a family, who that's the way they would travel. Oh, there looks like an interesting road and they'd go down there. If, uh, if we do that <clears throat> without anything definite, it's okay if you start out in the morning, I guess, and you say, you know, today God show us something beautiful, so they're looking for it. I, I don't know. But I'm saying for you and I, I think there's times when you say, God, show me clearly what that goal would be. Six, we really should desire a mission accomplished. Desire a mission accomplished. It should really be in our hearts that we want to see this thing through. We want to see it happen. So we go to verse 42 now, jumping out of the verses we read. It says, And I came this day unto the well and said, O Lord God of my master Abraham, if now thou do prosper my way in which I go. So what he's saying again is, please give me success on this mission. Had a well-planned way to find his wife, and his plan worked. Now, how will you know when you reach your goal if you don't know what your goal was? How long are you going to take at reaching a goal? Some things you know you should have done already, maybe. And I ask you this question before we go on to the next point. Is your future worth the effort? Think about that. Is my future worth the effort of setting some worthwhile goals that God is pleased with and striving toward them? I have noticed that I talked about runners. There's bikers on the road. And you know, there's a lot of bikers on the road that are old guys, like my age, <laughs> riding bike. Check it out sometime if you haven't noticed. And I'm thinking, oh, that's got to hurt till you get to your goal. <laughs> Setting goals may, if you will, hurt. But they got a reason to do it. Keeping in shape, whatever. Job may not call for physical action. Mine calls for enough, so I don't have to do it. Isn't that a good excuse? We have excuses for not pushing on for our goals. Is your future worth the effort? Number seven, you will need to persevere, and with persevering comes long-suffering, if you will, to, to push on. And in verse 21, it says, the man wondering at her held his peace. Okay, so Eliezer's watching, and he kept his mouth shut. How many of you are good at keeping your mouth shut? <laughs> okay, we won't ask for a raise of hands. But most of us know that we're not patient enough sometimes to keep our mouth shut and just observe, just listen, whatever it might be. Well, here it says he's, he's watching. And he's watching to wit whether the Lord had made his journey prosperous or not. New International Version would say it this way, without saying a word, he watched her closely to learn whether or not the Lord had made his journey successful. Think about conquerors. They don't give up. Conquerors don't give up. You can't conquer if you quit halfway. If you get sidetracked, phone booth, partway. 
If you don't have a goal when you take off in the first place, you can't conquer. They've learned that it takes work, perseverance, and moods are not their master. The master is their master. Okay? Moods are not their master, the master is. <sighs> I don't feel like doing this today. This is too tough. Maybe you set uh, more time with the Lord, whatever it might be. And wow, life is so busy. And it is. For many of us, it is quite busy. So it takes much patience at times. And uh, Eliezer here in verse 21. He was able to delay the gratification. You know, my tendency would be, I wouldn't be able to wait, I'd have to say. Would you consider going with me? <laughs> now wait. Just wait a little bit and watch. Some are good at waiting. Some of us are not good at waiting. Watch closely, quietly. We have to delay gratification. Sometimes, you're not going to like this, Sometimes you have to do the tough thing instead of the fun thing. You get that? It's something you'd rather do, but you need to do the tough thing. The right thing instead of the pleasurable thing. And I wish I wouldn't have to say this, but it's true in life, and that is that any goal that's worth reaching, achieving, will have obstacles in the way. Next, let's consider the cost a bit. Verse 53. You remember there were ten camels. There was something on them camels. Those camels were well loaded down. He brought forth jewels of silver, jewels of gold, raiment, gave them to Rebekah, and he gave also to her brother and to his mother precious things. Have you, now yeah, I know you've heard it, nothing's free, right? If you receive something and you didn't have to pay it, somebody had to pay for that. Might not have been you, but is, so we say nothing's free. So if you will, he paid a price, and back then we understand there's dowry and all that, so he paid a price, and he had brought that along, he was prepared for that, to get Rebecca to come back with him and marry Isaac. It's going to require great sacrifice. So maybe some good questions for you to ask is, what will this cost? Have a look at what will it cost? What am I willing to give or give up? And is it worth it? It's very important that we count the costs or we're not going to. It's going to be very difficult to achieve a goal. Because you're going to come up against the cost, if you will, and you're going to say, ah, this isn't worth it. My brothers and I often talk about we went a half a mile. We had to walk to school uphill both ways. Remember that? And then on the way back, there was always this race. I've talked about that. And I talked about the fact that I'm the oldest brother. The next one down always beat to the door. And that frustrated me. But you see, as I was running along, it started to hurt in here. My legs got tired, and so I would slow down. And I'd back off. Now he pressed on. After he did that long enough, the run home was no big deal. And if I'd have pressed on, maybe I'd have done it. But I did redeem myself in later years when we started to grow more this way. <laughs> and uh, us boys had a race that I was the first one back, but I pushed like crazy. And the uh, reward there was a great, big root beer float. Which was great. 
but I needed about 10 minutes to, you know, to enjoy it. So was it worth it? Yes, it was worth it. I reached my goal. I made it. But was it really worth it to be the first one back from school? What happened was cookies and milk and then get out to work. <laughs> That's pretty exciting to come home to. Chore time. Well, that was considered a cost. Let's think about it lastly. Celebrate the goal reached. You reach that goal, celebrate it. Rejoice in it. Isaac, it says in verse 63, he was going out to the field. He's going to do some meditating just about the time night was coming on. Even Tidy calls it in King James. He lifted up his eyes and he looked in the distance. Now allow me to do some thinking here. Those are dad's camels. Those are dad's camels coming back. Hey, that's Ellie. He's your coming back. Yep, there's five, six. Yep, there's ten of them. Yep. I'm putting more of that in scripture here. And so Rebecca also sees them and she pulls the veil. She gets off of the camel and pulls the veil down. I think there was celebration when he took her to be his wife, don't you think? I was pretty excited when I got my wife. That sounds like buying a car. But you know what I'm, what I'm saying. <laughs> it could have been said better. But anyhow, uh, the excitement when we get something that we really strove for. I don't know what goals he has for you or what he might want you to pursue. But I pondered that a bit and I said, I wonder what goals he might have. The goals that I might have are not the goals that you need to have. That's what you ask God for. Any changes I should make in the coming year? Show me, God. I want to be willing to make them. What my desire is for each one of you here this morning or listening to this message is that your best years would be yet to come. That this next year is going to be great for you. You're going to be excited about life. Even though it throws some curveballs like we had this past year, life will be exciting for you. It can be that way in Christ. Father, we thank you for your faithfulness and goodness to us in the past year. And it's hard to believe that we are coming this close, the close of another year, and many of us gathered here together will not see each other till next year, quite possibly. I pray your blessing upon each one. And I pray that you'd help me and each one of us to have a serious look at this area, and God, what would you have me to be? Are there any definite goals that I should set for my life that we should set for our lives? And what do you want to do with us in our families, collectively in the church, the church at large, far and wide, your people? Mother, I think we have yet to imagine and see what you could do with us as we are serious before you and seeking you first in your kingdom. I pray that you give us that desire Give us that courage. Give us that stamina. Help us to persevere in the way that you'd have us to go. I thank you for the body here. I thank you for the growth. I see those who have determined to go with you and to grow in you and are learning and applying. Bless them, Father. Make them fruitful. And as each one of us are fruitful, your kingdom will multiply. We ask your blessing in Jesus' name. Amen.